Most of my Linux videos are for a fairly intermediate audience, but every so often I'll see a commenter who is completely new to Linux. So I thought, hey, why don't we do at least one video targeting that audience? And I thought, what else better to do than talk about confusing Linux terminology? And where else better to start than talk about what is Linux? So Linux can mean two separate things, Linux as the kernel and Linux as the operating system. We'll start with Linux as the kernel. So when you have a working Linux system, like mine for example, your system runs in two main separate modes, user space and kernel space. Sometimes you'll also see user mode and kernel mode. Those mean the exact same thing. Now, when we say that Linus Torvalds created Linux, we are talking about creating the Linux kernel. Now, the kernel is this piece of software that exists between your hardware and your higher level software you want to run. It is the piece of software that tells your computer to basically do useful computer things. It's where your device drivers live, your file system, your virtual memory, your scheduler, and all of these other low level components and building blocks telling your computer to actually do the things an operating system needs to do. Now the Linux kernel by itself is a really cool project. The problem is to a user, it's not really that useful. It doesn't include any of that user space software that makes computer actually useful to a user. So in the very early days of Linux, it started being bundled with software from another project called the GNU project. This included software to do things like listing files, making folders, viewing files, editing files and other basic operations that you want to be able to do on a computer. And in those early days, people started calling it GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. But nowadays, most people just drop the GNU part and they call the Linux kernel with this user space software, the Linux operating system. But most people out there except the most insane Linux users aren't building Linux from scratch. Instead, what they're doing is downloading a Linux distro. This takes the Linux kernel, the GNU user space tooling, or maybe they replace it with another version like the BusyBox tooling, and then add additional things like maybe a GUI. Maybe they include a web browser. Maybe they pre-install Steam. Maybe they change up the theming. And all of these different things to give you a unique look at how Linux can be used. There are distros like Ubuntu Linux, Fedora Linux, PopOS, Manjaro, Arch Linux, Gentoo Linux, and the list goes on and on and on and on. There are thousands of distros out there. Many of them are fairly similar, but some of them provide a completely unique experience. Like if you look at Ubuntu, this has pretty much everything you want. It has a GUI, it has all of the software you want pre-installed, but then Arch Linux, this is a very simple and stripped down system. It doesn't even ship with a GUI. You just get a flashing terminal. And the kind of distro you start with depends on what you're trying to get out of Linux. Do you just want a Linux environment to do some programming? We'll try out something like Ubuntu or PopOS or Fedora or one of these more complete solutions. Do you want to learn a lot about your system's internals? Maybe try out Arch Linux or Gentoo. Do you want to send all your data to the North Korean government? Try out Red Star OS. When you're looking for a distro, you'll probably also come across the terms flavor and spin. These basically mean distro in a more specialized manner. So when you have a distro that is a modified version of Ubuntu, and it's basically trying to be a part of the wider Ubuntu family, it's trying to be like Zubuntu or Lubuntu or Ubuntu Unity, where it's still following the Ubuntu guidelines, but it has a different GUI available. This is what is known as a flavor. Flavor is only used in the context of Ubuntu. Now spin basically means the exact same thing, but for distros that are a modified version of Fedora. If it's trying to be an official part of Fedora, it is a Fedora spin. But when you're looking through these different flavors and spins that have different GUIs, you're going to very quickly see the terms desktop environment and window manager, often just abbreviated to DE and WM respectively. Now, a window manager is what it sounds like. It is a program that manages the locations of your windows. Say, for example, in my case, if I make a new terminal, it's going to take up the entire screen. If I make another one, it's going to split that window. If I make another one again, it's going to split that. 
I can drag it around like I would with a window on Windows. I can close the window. I can move it between different virtual desktops. I can go over to that desktop. And all of this is being controlled with hotkeys on my keyboard. And great examples of window managers are things like i3, BSPWM, Awesome WM, DWM, Openbox, and various others. But the window manager is just that application that controls locations of your windows. A desktop environment takes a window manager and then adds all of the additional software you want, like your web browser, like your office suite, like a video capture tool, and all of the other things you might want to have. Great examples of desktop environments being GNOME, KDE, XSCE, Cinnamon, Budgie, and a bunch of others. Now think of a desktop environment similar to a distro. So a distro bundles all of the software alongside the Linux kernel, making it actually useful. A desktop environment bundles all of the software alongside a window manager to make it actually useful. But if you want to, you can do what I do, download a window manager by itself and then add in all of the additional software you want to have the system do exactly what you need and make it truly your own. When you are looking at a window manager, there are two main categories to consider, tiling and floating. Now a tiling window manager is one where if you make a window, it automatically places it into a certain location based on the rules of that window manager. Certain window managers let you modify these rules or set a new location for it to go, but the general idea is it automatically places the window into this tiling sort of layout. Now, a floating window manager works more akin to Windows does. So if you have this window over here and you can just drag it around anywhere on the screen, this is known as a floating window manager. Now, many of the tiling window managers out there are actually hybrid window managers, where they provide tiling functionality alongside floating functionality as well. To be extra confusing, sometimes they're not called floating window managers, instead they're called stacking window managers, but floating and stacking mean the exact same thing. One piece of software often bundled with a desktop environment is a display manager. But unlike window manager, the name does not mean what you think it means. There is a lot of historical context behind why that is a name and why it made sense in the past that deserves a 20 minute video unto itself. But nowadays, the thing that is important is display manager means login screen and lock screen. Examples being SDDM, LightDM, GDM, and a bunch of others. Another piece of software often bundled is a terminal. The reason we're talking about this is people often confuse the components. So this right here, this window, this is the terminal. This is not the terminal. This is not the terminal. This is not the terminal. The whole window, the whole window, that is the terminal. If I go and open another one, this window here is also a terminal. It is a different terminal, but it's still a terminal. Terminal is short for terminal emulator. It is emulating a physical terminal. Before we had these nice computer monitors, this is how you would interact with a computer. And when you're not seeing a GUI, you also have the TTY, the Teletype Terminal. This is also a terminal. The next component we have is the prompt. See this white rectangle? If I hover over the window, now it is a flashing line. This is prompting me to write something. This is the prompt. Now this thing on the left hand side, this is also part of the prompt as well. So if I go into a different directory, like my videos directory, now it is going to say I'm in the videos. This is something that you can customize to say whatever you want. I like it to just say where I currently am. Some people like it to say if they're in a programming environment, the time of the day, their battery percentage and various other things. But everything on this line is a prompt. Now some people like to have a prompt that goes over multiple lines. I'm not a big fan of that, I think it just wastes some space. Now, CLI, Command Line Interface. We all know what a GUI, a GUI or a Graphical User Interface is. This is a GUI. I can drag my mouse around, I can select things, there are buttons, there are graphics for me to control an application. But not every application is controlled using a graphical method. Some applications are controlled by running commands. So if I want to check the manual for some random application like uh, ls, for example, I can use the man command and then pass in ls. 
And that brings up the manual for the ls command. We didn't get into this application using a button or using any sort of graphical method. Instead, what we did is use a command for it. Now, inside the manual, we are not controlling it using commands. Instead, what we're doing is controlling a text-based user interface, a TUI. I can scroll around this, I can quit out of it, and various other things. A better example might be BTOP. This is a program showing me everything that is running. This is sort of a middle ground between a command line interface and a graphical user interface. But one thing I haven't told you is the program that's telling these commands or programs to run. Because the prompt isn't running man ls. The terminal isn't running man ls. The thing that is running it is the shell. Common examples being bash, zsh, and fish. Or over on the Windows side, you have PowerShell. These all provide different methods for interacting with the programs available on your system, and all provide different scripting languages to automate things going on. One common program you'll interact with through a CLI in your terminal is your package manager. So on Linux, we don't typically download programs from random websites. Instead, what we do is use our package manager, which automatically downloads the application and everything else it needs to run. So unlike on Windows where random applications will just have wizards, here it is all done with one centralized wizard. And with a few exceptions of applications that just don't want to follow the rules, Discord for example, most applications don't update themselves. Instead, your package manager also handles updating your entire system. And different Linux distros are going to have different package managers available. Now, that doesn't mean every distro out there has their own package manager. Really, there are only a couple of independent distros, and then other distros are modified versions of them. So you have things like a Debian-based distro, which uses apt. You'll have Arch-based distros, which use Pac-Man. You'll have Fedora-based distros using DNF and Yum. You'll have Gen 2 based distros using Emerge, so on and so forth. With the exception of Emerge and Gen 2 and a couple of others out there, most distros and package managers don't deal in source code. All of those videos you've seen about installing a web browser on Linux and it's just a wall of compiling code, mostly nonsense. Most distro developers instead compile the applications for you and send you the pre-compiled versions. Now, often what you'll hear is this is called a binary, a blob, or a binary blob. It's source code that's being compiled to run on your computer. It is this thing that's hard to examine. It's just this blob of software. When we want to download software with our package manager, the distro developers have to store that software somewhere that people can actually download from. This is stored in a repository, sometimes called a package repository or a software repository. In the same vein, if we put source code onto GitHub, this is known as a source code repository. Shifting gears a bit, over on the Windows side, most regular user accounts are also the administrator account. It's really convenient if you want to just install software, do some other low-level thing to have your regular account also be the administrator. It's also a giant security vulnerability if that account gets compromised, anything can be done on your system. So on Linux, what we do is split this higher level functionality into what is known as the root user. This is the user that has ultimate control on the system. This user can install software. They can delete your entire hard drive. They can do whatever they want. But in certain cases, you might want to give your regular user temporary root privilege. This is done with a command you've probably seen sudo. Considering the popularity of the Steam Deck, that may have been your first introduction to Linux. Now, on the Steam Deck, most of the games you're playing are not native games. Instead, they are Windows games that are running through a compatibility layer. But what does it mean for something to be a native game or a native application or native software? When something is native, that means it has been compiled to run directly on Linux. It is not using some additional tooling to make a Windows game work on Linux. It is made for Linux and running on Linux. It is native to the Linux ecosystem. Two more things left and we are going low level. So when you turn your computer on, when you boot your computer, 
How does it know where Linux is stored on your hard drive? How does it know where Windows is stored? How does it know where Mac OS is stored or any other operating system you might be using? Does it just try every location possible or is there a better solution? Well, it looks for something called a bootloader. Where the bootloader needs to be stored is dependent on the kind of hardware you are running. The bootloader can then go and start up whatever operating system it's supposed to start up, in this case being Linux. And until you restart your computer, that is the end of the role of the bootloader. But the Linux kernel doesn't do everything by itself as well. It starts another application called your init system, your initialization system. This will start up all of the applications that need to be running to make your operating system actually function, to have all of your user space tooling actually running. And with that, the video is over. So hopefully you learnt something. I know this is a very basic video and if you're someone more advanced using Linux, there might not have been that much to get out of it, but even so, I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below if there's any terms you think I should have covered. I feel like I covered most of the basic ones, but maybe I missed something. Let me know. If you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one over, these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe to the Barrow Pay link in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and don't get on my case about Linus or Linus. It's both. Go away.